Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome back, everybody. We want to talk about glimmers today, and we're going to talk with Nancy uh, Picard about glimmers. And this all came about because I found a LinkedIn post uh, from Nancy about the topic of glimmers. And what it is, is it's these little things that feed your flame of life, that make that, that life spark, that life flame brilliant and bright and as she puts it on the scale from 1 to 10 10 being the brightest flame that you that you can possibly have in your life that these glimmers feed that flame and they're just little events that make you happy make you feel good fill you with energy those people that also help fill you with energy because they're, they just feel so good to be around. Um, you're going to hear Nancy say some things maybe about her children, her grandchildren, and maybe even her the fact that she climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. Maybe we might hear some things about that. But it's Nancy's term, glimmers, and how they help feed our life and help us move past that comfort zone and into the success and purpose that we're supposed to have in our lives. So why don't we bring Nancy into the show and let's talk about glimmers. Well, I posted one thing. I posted a meme about glimmers, and really, what glimmers is is just because um, I don't remember what we talked about on your last podcast. But basically, we, getting out of your yeah, comfort we, zone we, is what I normally talk about. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah, the it was we we stayed very focused to your book. Oh, we did. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I feel far away from that. I've been doing much more relationship and marriage coaching, so that's actually where um, where I've been going. But I go wherever the podcast wants to go. But <laughs> well, um, no, no, because it's all about relationships in the end, right? Well, yeah. I mean, well, no, not all. No, not all my coaching's about relationships. You know, some no. People, I mean, I mean, our, our lives. It's all about. Re, be yeah, able yeah, to relate but to other people yeah. and 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 learning how to move forward. So glimmers. So I'll get you to define uh, the glimmer. Yeah, I don't think and it's then, glimmers is just um, 
Climbers is is the opposite of looking for what's wrong in your life. So people, we always have a negative bias. Like that's basically through evolution. Yeah. You got to look at what's wrong so you could stay safe. You know, right. we don't have we don't have a tiger coming after us anymore so yes. we don't have to do that but our yeah. negative bias is still the same that everyone's always looking for what's wrong instead of what's right and so i always talk about putting on a pair of glasses and looking for what's right and that's what glimmers are the glimmers are the things in your life that that spark you up yeah right and so yeah yeah. But that's the comfort zone, so we can go wherever you want to go. I don't care. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, actually, I got a, I got a really good good tie in for that. Okay. Okay. So, um, is that new artwork behind you, or same artwork? I that's from uh, the that was at the bottom of Kilimanjaro after I climbed Kilimanjaro. There were artists at the bottom that were yeah. selling paintings. I probably paid oh, less th yeah, thank you. I, 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 had, I didn't until you closed the door. I hadn't noticed that 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 actually makes a big difference. Well, the but door. I'm also I'm yeah. in the way of the, yeah. the artwork. Yeah, and yeah. It, it right. no, it, it makes it it makes your artwork come up a, a little a little bit more because you yeah. you closed the door. Yeah. Or now you've hidden the door. So yeah, we're <laughs> even better. <laughs> if it just frames better. It's not new. <laughs> How's that? It, I, I, I got it at the bottom of Kilimanjaro in a rolled thing. I took yeah. it home. I probably paid less than $100 to buy it, and I probably spent 10 times that to frame it when you uh, get back to the country. Yeah, see, that's why I learned to frame things myself. <laughs> it's, I no. spend a lot. Of yeah. No, actually, you can. I understand you can spend a lot. Uh, uh, some framing projects, I've done some frame some photographs for people that um just in glass alone that we paid like hundreds of dollars just for the glass yeah yeah so um anyway yeah now i do have the, the sound completely balanced out <laughs> okay, go ahead. you always have a good story all right mm -hmm. so why don't we get started okay. in five four three two one so welcome back, Nancy. And I remember um, it was a few months ago that that, that I saw a post of, of yours about glimmers. And one of the things that people do when they get, really get stuck in, a, in that comfort zone is they get stuck on what's wrong with them and instead of what is right with them. And I remember a post of yours being about glimmers where we start to focus on what's right in our lives so we can be grateful for them and move forward, right? Exactly. So we have a negative bias. All of us have a natural negative bias. It comes back from our caveman days where you had to be like, am I safe? Am I safe? Am I safe? What's not working in my environment? What's not right? You know, we don't have those silver tooth tigers coming after us anymore, but we still innately have the bias to look for what's wrong. And so I talk to my clients all the time about taking off the what's wrong glasses and putting on the what's right glasses and looking your life through what's right. Because when you look for what's wrong, the only thing I can promise you is you're going to find it. And what you put your attention on is what you get more of. So if you're looking for what's wrong, you're going to find it and you're going to get more of it. You know, if you think, oh, my God, nothing ever works out for me. Well, guess what? Nothing's going to work out for you. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. glimmers are those things in our life that actually bring us joy, that are working. And what's a glimmer for me may not be a glimmer for you. But, yeah. you know, if you get a hold of what your glimmers are, if you take a little time and make a list of the things that jazz you up, you know, what makes you feel joyful, what makes you feel alive, what gives your, you know, joie de vie going, those are the things you want to put your attention on and you want to incorporate them more in your life. You know, oh, like I feel really great. I, I personally, this is me speaking, I have to be outside every single day hiking, biking, skiing, pickleballing. I have to be outside. 
even if it's raining, I'm outside with my dog and I'm in the elements and that's a glimmer for me. Yeah. That jazzes me up, that charges me. That's like, if I do that, then whatever else I have to do for my day works. And so that's actually how I schedule my life. I Lots of times, maybe three or four days a week, I'll have a client at 7.30 in the morning, but then I don't work again until one or two every right. single day. And that whole great juicy part of the day belongs to me being outside in nature with my dog doing one of those activities those are glimmers for me yeah there, there's i'm going to invite everybody to, to look for you on link lincoln i'll say that again i'm going to invite everybody to look for you on linkedin and nancy's last name is spelled p i c k a r d um for those of you who may be star trek fans Put the K in Picard, and you got <laughs> and you got Nancy's name. Um, forgive me for that, Nancy. <laughs> okay, <I'm> related. Uh, <laughs> but there's um, there's lots of pictures of you on LinkedIn where you got your bigger, better, braver ball cap on, and you're outside whitewater rafting rock climbing whatever it is out out there in nature and and it's exciting to follow you that way also um yeah because th that's your glimmers right those are my glimmers i mean yeah. i have a lot of glimmers. just just being with my dog is a glimmer i mean being with my partner and doing something fun being with my girlfriends is always a glimmer I love playing pickleball with couples and girlfriends like those things they jazz me up so does sitting there on on Zoom and letting my you know eight year old grandchildren read to me, or me reading to my three and a half year old grandchildren. Those are all things that like just make me feel good about life. And we all have them, and some of us have more than others. And some of us just need to spend some time making a list so that we they we, they recognize them and we all get them. Yeah. So. Making a list, writing them down, these things, is, is that the first one of the first steps in actually being able to focus on them so you can introduce more of them into your life? Uh, I think when you write something down, it becomes a plan. It mm -hmm. becomes real. And um, I just think that we are so busy in our lives doing versus being that we don't really take the time to really say, wow, these are the things that are working in my life. These are the things that like, I talk about people having an, an internal flame. So on a scale of one to 10, I'll say to my clients, where's your flame today? You know, is it a rip roaring 10 and life is just rocking and everything's working and smooth and you couldn't be happier? Or is it a three where, you know, you're bogged down and you got a lot of incompletes in your life and some of your relationships aren't working and so your flame is pretty low so then i'll say okay so what did you do this week that raised your flame and what did you do this week that lowered your flame so when you start to get out of autopilot and see the things that are actually raising your flame so you can do more of those versus lower your flame like oh every time i talk to this person my, I have a low flame. Well, let's not talk to this person every every day or, you know, right. really back off from your communication with people that are not feeding you. Right. That are not feeding your flame. And that's, you've got to get out of autopilot so you can even recognize what's working and what's not. Yeah. Yeah, I, I noticed that um, because more, more recently that um, my niece and... One of my close friends, they're both in the hospital, and they're both in the hospital for pretty much the same reason, that they are, have spent so much time ignoring their own self-care and their own self-worth. Um, and um, we're, we're not going to get into too much the, the psychological or the, the category reasons for it, but, but they, they landed in the hospital, and... And I'm trying to communicate with them and all that kind of stuff. And I noticed that my flame usually has a, a very big flicker, was much lower flicker. Um, so 
I decided that this weekend I'm going to take a break from going to visit them in the hospital and I'm going to do something more for myself. And, um, yeah, I mean, you know, just, I can have clients that are depressed in in a bad way and it's hard to keep your energy up mm -hmm. because their energy is so low. And so sometimes my energy can feed their energy and bring them up, but sometimes their energy is so low um, that I get off the phone and I'm like, oof, I, I, I've got to do something to bring my energy back up. Right. So we feed off of each other's energy for sure. Yeah. And the, the only thing I'll say about the self-worth and the self-care is that if you don't feel worthy of taking care of yourself and making yourself a priority, then you have no self-care. And so that's mm -hmm. the problem. That would be bottom line, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you have to care enough about yourself to recognize that your needs matter, your voice matters, taking care of yourself, putting yourself first is all part of recognizing your own self-worth. Yeah. Now, I'm going to dive into this for a second because you have a... A spectrum of, of things that you actually help people with from mm -hmm. going out on stage and being the the, 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 the public speaker to um, just simply learning to speak better with uh, with those that are in your own home right right and going back to that self-worth if you don't feel worthy all those other things start to suffer don't they well, yes, you, if you don't love yourself, it's very difficult for you to love somebody else. You're feeding off of other people because you can't feed off of yourself. Mm -hmm. If you don't stand in your own self-worth, you don't set healthy boundaries. And that's one of the things I do is I'm a boundary coach. You So you don't set healthy boundaries. You don't make yourself a priority. You kind of have this feeling like, well, if people love me, they'll know. They'll know what I want them to do. Well, that's not true. We're not mind readers. You have to be able to tell people what you need and what you want with grace and ease, a request versus a demand, mm -hmm. so that you get needs met. And people who have very low self-esteem or they're, they have a childhood belief buried in their subconscious that I need to be perfect to be loved or... I need to stay quiet to be safe, or I need to take care of others to be loved. These are the kinds of beliefs that are, we're not even aware that we have, but we have them from our childhood that actually keep us from being able to make ourselves a priority or to stop people pleasing or to learn that being selfish is not a bad thing and being selfless is not a good thing, that they're on the same continuum and you need to be someplace in the middle you need to know when to be selfish and you need when to be selfless yeah so how does how does that that actually work out it, because we have we have this gut feeling it's like we should be paying closer attention to it and uh, that'll tell us when we need a little more less and a little more ish <laughs> i think that if you wrap your head around being selfish or being selfless is not a good thing that you disappear. There's less of you selfless, right? Yeah. Uh, when you can wrap your head around that there is definitely putting yourself first and making yourself a priority is a healthy thing to do. And that it's just like being on an airplane and putting your own mask on first so you can help others. If you are so busy taking care of everybody else and there's no time for you, you end up being very depleted and you end up being passive aggressive and all of a sudden out of nowhere you'll explode because your needs have not been met for so long and you don't even realize that they're not being met because you haven't made yourself a priority. You can't expect other people to make them, you, you a priority when you don't make yourself a priority. And so... I tell people, you can't be angry for not getting what you never asked for. Right. And that's what happens. Yeah. People think their family is going to be a mind reader, and they're not. Yeah. Well, it, 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 there's a lot, lot of that um, 
see it in, in the inter entertainment industry where the, the script says that, oh, I gave of myself and, and the people just understood that I needed that thing. And it's like, that's, yeah, that's not reality, right? <laughs> it's not reality. And I think that the biggest problem many people have, more women than men, but I know a lot of male, male clients that are the same way, that when you overgive and when you tie yourself up in a pretzel to be digestible to other people, you lose yourself. And when you lose yourself, you, you, you're lost, really. Like, I am really good at taking care of myself, um, knowing what my needs are, and making sure that my needs get met, and asking for what I need. I talk a lot about relational generosity, which is you give your partner whatever they're asking for. If it doesn't cost you too much to give it to them, that's what you do. That's being relationally generous. And I do that in my life, and I do that with my partner, and I do that with my children. But I also have a stop now that I didn't used to have where, okay, this is actually going to infringe on my time too much or it's going to take too much from me or I can't come that week, but I could come this week. I'm, I've am i gotten really clean and clear on my own boundaries and it's made me a more peaceful, productive, happy human being. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. What doesn't make sense to me though, and I hear that, I hear uh, people say this all the time that, oh, well, I have to, I have to leave hints for him, or I have to like, um, well, I have to guide her towards something. And it's like rather than just uh, simply asking for what it is that you want, be clear. There's and, no place for being passive aggressive. You're you're so much better off not only asking in a request for what you need. But then empowering your partner to actually be successful in giving you what you need. So would you be willing to um, check in with me every night before you come home so I know when to make dinner? All right. That would be a request. Mm -hmm. What do you need from me so that you can do that? Right. Maybe they're going to say, could you just text me around 4 o'clock and – Check in, and I'll say, well, no, I actually don't want to have to do that, but what I will do is set up a reminder on your phone at 5 o'clock every day. So at 5 o'clock, you can tell me. The reminder will go off. That's all about you. It has nothing to do with me, and you'll tell me what time you're coming home so I can plan my evening. Like, that's yeah, empowering them to give me what I'm asking for. Right. Yeah, and uh, see, it, it, and it's not really as hard as it sounds, is it? So easy. A lot of people have a lot of trouble being vulnerable and asking for what they need. And that's where the messiness comes in because they don't ask for what they need because they don't want to be vulnerable, but then they actually are making communication really poor and then they're going to get mad and the per other person's not going to know why are they getting mad and what's going on and so yeah i think clear communication open communication honesty mm -hmm. I mean, really when you're listening to your partner when your partner has a need stop listening to respond or to talk about your part just be in their part yeah. just be compassionately curious to their interpretation, their subjective interpretation of what happened. If they're trying to repair and talk about something, don't make it your time to put in your two cents about what's going on for you. Let it be about them. Let them be there for them. And you can talk about your stuff another time. That's being a good listener and moving towards repair instead of away from it. That's good advice. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder you're the coach. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we work with a lot of couples, marriage, re you know, relationships, relationships, not just, you know, husband and wife, but mother and daughter, all kinds of 
Yeah. Teams. Yeah. Oh, that's that's part of um, part of it is you, you you also said team where if we're working as a team we can communicate freely amongst ourselves to working towards a common goal, right? Yeah, you have to get over who's right and who's wrong. It doesn't matter who cares. Yeah. who's right and who's wrong is who cares. You know, you want to be in a happy relationship or you want to be right because you can't be both. Right. And so it's about, you know, a lot of times in relationships, there's one that's up and one that's down, like power over. I try to bring them to same thing as you can have power over or you can have a relationship. You can't do both. You just can't. Right. So um, a lot of times it's just helping people see the patterns that they're doing in the relationship. And it's the pattern that's not working. When he does this, I do that, and then when they do that, then I do this, and we're off to the races. Instead of instead of relating, they're uh, they're reacting. Correct. Yeah. Um, I, when you were doing the whole hand thing, uh, it reminded me of the saying, uh, and you still hear a lot of people say, "I want to make sure I get the upper hand," and it is like. Yeah. Do you need the upper hand, or do you need right. to just simply communicate? Both hands, right? Yeah. Do you need your hands to be on the same level? Yeah. That would be better. Yeah. Yeah. So but it's hard. You get into like you know, relationships are hard. Nobody said relationships are easy. Relationships are hard. Yeah. You actually come together with somebody to heal your wounds, and so to heal your wounds means that you've probably attracted somebody who is similar enough to the parent that caused the wounds, but different enough that you're hoping for a different outcome. Mm -hmm. And so when you get together with somebody, your wounds fit together like, you know, like a, a lock and key. And you can either see where the triggers are and then work on yourself when you're feeling triggered knowing that, oh, yeah, this person's in my life so I can work on these things. Or you can have all these fights and blow-ups and not work on yourself and end up splitting with that person and bringing the exact same wounds into the next relationship. So my advice to everybody is stay with the relationship you're in. You've already attracted somebody in to work on the exact wounds you need to work on. And don't expect your partner to heal your wounds. You have to heal your own wounds by recognizing the triggers and then learning how to work from there. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Is um, triggers triggers are there are there for us to learn, right? Triggers are there to show us where we're still not healed. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, and that becomes it becomes a really, really good process. And I was re re reminded of of this um, that um, seeking out help, like from you, to uh, to, to actually, hey, we're, we're in a rough patch. Why don't we turn to someone like uh, maybe like Nancy or or someone like you that uh, that will help help us be a guide. Because yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm a relational life therapist, and well, I'm a relational life coach from the relational life therapy school, and um, I help people all the time. A lot of them are on the brink of divorce, and they can't believe that within like three or four weeks they're in such a better place because of just the communication tools and and showing them their patterns and helping them see what their wounds are and where they are in what they need to do and to work on it together as a couple so that I, I work towards relational empowerment versus individual empowerment. So, so you help, you help them. If I'm putting this the right way, you're going to have to, you're going to have to like, uh, correct me a little bit. <laughs> okay. Um, so you, so you help them provide a a safe place for for them to heal each other's wounds, and they're providing a safe by being in that relationship. They're providing that safe place that you can heal your triggers and heal heal the wounds that are there, right? 
Yeah, the only thing you said wrong is that nobody but you can heal your wounds. Your yeah. partner covers you so that your wounds are activated, but then it's your job to work on why you're still getting activated. Mm -hmm. You know, what did they say? How are you interpreting it? How else can you interpret it? How can you stop the communication and take a time out so that you can come down from your dysregulation that you're in at that moment and get back into a regulated state. I talk about the wise adult part of your brain, which is the prefrontal cortex, or the adaptive child part of your brain, which is the childish part of your brain, that, that as a child you learn to adapt to all the things that you needed to adapt to. And so it kept you safe as a child. It was, you know, adaptive then becomes maladaptive as an adult. And so when we get triggered, and we get this whoosh and we're angry and we want to like do something bad, we're in our adaptive child. And when I can help people recognize what it feels like to be in the adaptive child, I can also then teach them you need to take a time out so you can regulate and get back into your wise adult part of your brain so that you're not going to act foolishly and you're not going to say things you don't want to say because your adaptive child part of your brain is not interested in intimacy or relationality. It only wants to do what it knows it did as a child. And it does not care about the relationship at all. It's all me, me, me. Hmm. I just threw a lot at you. Yeah. But, it, but, but you know, you, you, if, if you sit and you take the time, you can actually see how that sorts into your own life though, right? Of course, we all do it. We all get triggered. Mm -hmm. we all get into our adaptive child. I have, I know a lot of people that basically live in their adaptive child. They spend very little time in their wise adult part of their brain. They just don't know it. Mm, yeah, they, um, um, I, I can think of a, of a few few friends and um, as someone another. I have a few old friends, um, and as one said said to me, it's like, well, I find it very difficult to connect with with the one because he never grew out of the out of that. Right. I, I have a friend like that too that I get triggered by all the time, and I re recognize that that person, their thinking, is so off from my thinking that I can't seem to be able to stay even killed with them. And yeah. I keep moving back and spending less and less time with them because when you're with somebody that's triggering you all the time, yes, you can work on yourself, but it's also a sign, just like I said before about the internal flame, what are the things that raise it and what are the things that lower it? If spending too much time with somebody lowers your internal flame, Note to self: Stop spending time with them. Yeah, yeah, I can tell you tell you that particular person that uh, even myself, I is not like I call them every, every every week or anything like that. Every now and again, it's like touch base, you know. Hey, how are things going, you know? And you, you get to hear the same old, same old, and they're like, okay, that's enough. For, we we've done that. <laughs> Yeah, I talk about that. I'm happy to have that. I have a lot of friends that I invite onto my couch, and now I have some friends that I only want on my front porch. Right. Don't let them into my inner circle, yeah. and that are all around. I don't get activated because I don't actually think about them as one of my closest friends. So when they don't act in a way that I think my close friends, I would like them to act. I don't get as triggered because I've already written them off that they're not one of my close friends anymore. And so I'm okay with the occasional conversations and I don't try to get them to, to change so that I can be happier with them as a close friend. I just let them be them and I will be, you know, you do you and I'll do me, but we're not going to be that close friends anymore. Right. Right. Do we feel guilty that that becomes a, a family member also? Well, you, you don't have to feel guilty if you've tried to help the communication and you've done whatever you think you can do 
to better the relationship. Mm -hmm. And then I, again, I would back off. I wouldn't back out. You know, I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, I, a, there's a difference, right? There's a difference. And I, I talk about those as being emotional incompletions. There are things that leave, they weigh heavy on you. Mm -hmm. And so I would rather somebody was on my front porch than not in the neighborhood. Because if they're not in the neighborhood, it becomes an incompletion. And then it weighs on me. But if they're just on my front porch, I can be okay with that. Hey, the front, the front porch can be a, a comfortable place, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah. Yeah. It, 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 that also leads back into us doing what we need to do for ourselves, that self-care, keeping them mm -hmm. on the porch instead of on the couch. It's a boundary. Be, yeah. Yeah, it's a self-care boundary. Yeah. When you're on my couch, I'm always in distress and sorry that I let you onto my couch. And I'm just not going to put myself in that position anymore. Yeah. So who 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 um who should we let on the couch? We'll be going back to to our flame. Anybody who who feeds our flame. Anybody who we we want in our lives in a close relationship. Friends, family, acquaintances. I mean, we're not really saying they're on my couch, but we're saying that they are they're in my life and I'm happy to have them on my life in yeah. whatever capacity that they are. Yeah. Some friends you talk to every day, sometimes you talk to twice a year. Um which just reminded me that one of my closest friends today is her birthday. And I did text her and call her, but I haven't caught her. But we probably talk eight times a year. And yet she's still a very close friend of mine. And I have other friends that I talk to every day or at least two or three times a week. It that's That doesn't make who's, who's a close person in your life and who's not. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, there's there's some people that um, that I I see or talk to them every day, and they're not quite in that inner circle. That they're just outside of it, and but I still interact with them every day. And then others that um, it's the occasion because of distance or something like that, or whatever, right. or circumstance, or whatever it is. Yeah, um, but. I can say this, that, that for those who, because of a circumstance or distance, when I do actually connect to them, I get that warm, fuzzy feeling all over. Yeah, right. You cannot see somebody for five years and you're right back exactly the way you were when you do see them. Yeah. I have friends like that all the time. Yeah. So... We have to we have to be careful uh, about um, when it comes to our self care the boundaries so that we actually it actually helps us develop better relationships right. Yes, if you have leaky boundaries, then people are going to walk all over you, or they're going to take too much from you because you're giving too much. Mm -hmm. um, again, back to you can't be mad for not getting what you didn't ask for, or if if you you know when I was when my grandchildren were, were young or and my kids were first parents I think I overgave and I overdid with them and for them and I was getting depleted and so I am still make myself available whenever I can but I when I go there I don't want to just be there for two weeks and be the only babysitter you know I finally had to say don't get rid of all your help just because I'm coming because I can't do 24-7 I want to go hiking with you and I want to do my clients and I still have other things I have to do. So yes, I want to spend as much time with my, if, with the kids as I can, but I also, I want to spend some time with my grown children. Like I don't want to just be the babysitter, even though I, I do come and do a lot of that. And once I said it, it made everything better. Because I didn't have to be passive aggressive. I didn't have to come for less time. I didn't get depleted. I still got to t take care of myself and spend time with my children and my grandchildren. And it works out so much better. Yeah, when you talk about your, your children and your grandchildren, you, you, you can actually see that inner glow come up for you. 
Yeah. <laughs> Love them all. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I, I, I see your point that it's like, okay, but I got to have that, that healthy boundary part so that I can keep my own energy up and my own fuel lines to, to my inner, inner flame, right? Exactly. So. Exactly. You, and nobody can tell you what that is but you. So that's self-worth and self-care and self-exploration and being curious about what you need and what you don't need and what works and what doesn't work. You have to do all your own inner work. Mm-hmm. To well, no be one else can do it for you, right? able and capable, nobody else can do it for you, right? Yeah. yeah. It's called inner work for a reason. Right. Yeah. So, um, back, back to, 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 uh, to, to glimmers is like, they, they sound it. And, uh, and that was one of the things I remember that it was like, oh, wow, this is a really healthy way to, to make sure we, we keep the, the things that we need in our lives to keep, keep, like you said, the inner flame up. Um, and, um, as going back to the law of attraction, that when we pay attention to those things, they keep that internal flame up and strong, that we get more of them, right? Exactly. So, so yeah. It's all a mindset game. Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly it, right? And when we work on ourselves, we improve our mindset, right? 100%. Yeah. So, anyway, it's been fun. And Thank you. I, 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 what I like, what I, one of the things I like about you is like, uh, I can see you, see you also being that guide to our, uh, climbing our Kilimanjaro of life. Yeah. <laughs> I had to throw the, throw the Kilimanjaro in there because I know you've, you've done that. <laughs> uh, that was going to be the name of my book before it was Bigger, Better, Braver. It was going to be What's Your Kilimanjaro? But then I realized that nobody, <clears throat> unless you were planning on climbing Kilimanjaro, would read the book. And it really wasn't right. about that. It's like, how do you find what's what your next thing is? You know, how do you do that next big thing that you're stuck and on the fence and you always say you want to do it, but now I don't have enough money or I'm too old or it's not for me or it's for other people or I'm not brave enough, any of that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. It's a... It will help you do that. So, yeah, and it all comes down to, well, what is your Kilimanjaro? What's that thing out there that you're, that seems like a big mountain that you're afraid to climb? Because I can help you climb it. Yeah. And it's, uh, as it goes, um, climbing the mountain is a journey. And, yeah, and the, that's journey. The, the the fun part is is experiencing the journey. Yeah, the juice is in the journey. I say it all the time. Yeah. So, what's hey. the what what are some of the the more favorite parts of of your journey? Of climbing Kilimanjaro. Oh, just or in general, Kilimanjaro is one of them. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, I would say okay. I would tell you that the best part of stepping outside your comfort zone and trying something new that you want to do is how good you feel about yourself for being brave enough to try. That's, that's where the juice is. Yeah. I it's not the outcome. Yeah. It's, it's right there in that moment of stepping in and saying yes and falling, falling through whether you fall on your face or not, the way you feel about yourself for doing it, is worth everything. There you go. People who are afraid of success or afraid of failure, so they never try, as far as I'm concerned, they've already failed. So I don't understand how that keeps you from the fear of failure or the fear of success. You, you haven't even tried. That's already fa fa failure, as far as I'm concerned. You know, we both agree on that on that point. And you know what? That's That's a great sum up. Awesome. <laughs> so, everybody, um, go look for Nancy P Pickard's book. Um, card. Bigger, Better, Braver, Conquer yeah. Your Fears, Embrace Your Courage, and Transform Your Life. 
or look for me on LinkedIn, Facebook, um, Instagram, or nancypicardlifecoach.com if you want to have a free consultation to see if coaching with me is something that you would like or you as a couple would like or either. Yeah. And or both. Yeah. Learn to live better. So, all right. Thank you, everybody, for listening today. And find that subscribe button wherever it may be. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you. Let me know when it's up, and I'll post it, too. Help us to This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.